how um, COVID-19 came about. And you wouldn't think that this would necessarily be a thing, but it is in fact. Um, this paper is really interesting and it was published on January 21st in Science of the Total Environment. And it may point to how some effects of climate change, um, the effects of climate change on the bat populations um, led to an increase in these bat-borne coronaviruses. We talked previously about how um, we're seeing an increase in the frequency of emerging infectious disease events. And we talked about the different factors that played a role, um, including human encroachment onto biodiverse ecosystems like tropical forests and deforestation, agricultural expansion, settlement growth, and other factors um, that were driving the emergence of these novel infectious diseases. But this paper also shows how climate change itself um, plays a role. And this graph from the paper shows the increase in the local number of bat species due to shifts in their geographical ranges. And these were driven by climate change. This is, they studied the time between 1901 and 1930. Um, so they looked at the, they compared the 1901 to 1930 period, the 1990 to 2019 period. The zoom area here represents the likely origin of the bat-borne ancestors of SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Now, SARS-CoV-1 is the original SARS-2003. This was, I don't, do you all remember this? From um, 2003, the bat reservoir host, uh, and then the, there was the palm intermediate host that went to humans killed a few hundred people, but it became a big news story. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is the current virus we're dealing with. It's the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. This area um, is the Chinese, I don't know how to pronounce it, Yunnan province and the neighboring regions of Myanmar and Laos. And it was found that the number of coronaviruses in the region strongly correlated with the richness of the number of bat species. Uh, it's made that climate change driven increase uh, increased 40 bat species across the region. And this corresponds to a rise in the local number of bat borne coronaviruses in the order of 100 plus or minus 50. Um, this is given that each bat species carries on average 2.67 coronaviruses. And we talked about before how bats are really cool in that they can carry a lot of viruses in their bodies without actually becoming sick. They have some really interesting adaptations because of their high metabolic demands for flight. Um, they're used to just having pieces of DNA like break off and go into plasm. And th this sort of usually is what causes a lot of the negative effects of having viruses in your body, where you have like the coronaviruses, they talked about the cytokine storm, the, this inflammation, and that's what leads to you getting really sick. The bats have these really cool anti-inflammatory pathways um, where they can handle pieces of their DNA being broken off and going into the cytoplasm. And a lot of viruses as a result of that in their systems without actually getting sick from them. And this is an important area to research as well and why bats are super important species to save and to um, study, hopefully in a nonviolent way. Um, but it, so this is why bats are known to be such really, such great reservoirs. Um, and then in this uh, study, they looked at where bats could um, live and they looked at the effects that that had on, on these populations. So as a result of climate change, um, you had a shift in the distribution of the natural biomes where, um, and biomes are these populations of plants and animals that result from a shared physical climate. 
their data showed that there was a shift from tropical shrublands to tropical savannas and deciduous woodland over the past century. These changes came about from due to higher CO2 levels, increased temperature, altered precipitation patterns, and decreased cloud cover. Uh, this process created a suitable environment for many bat species um, that occurred in that region. And these bat species in particular required a more forest type habitat. Um, so this explains the increased enrichmentness of the bat species in this area. This graph shows the changes in temperature recorded between 1901 and 1930, and those temperatures recorded between 1990 and 2019. And you can see, especially the months of October, November, and December, you can see an increase in mean temperatures, but even some increases in January, February, March, and April. Um, and then here is uh, the change in cloud cover over time. You can see how uh, monthly mean cloud cover percentages have decreased in recent decades which compared to 1900 and 1930. Um, you can also uh, see kind of the changes in precipitation patterns a little bit. The authors pointed out how previous studies um, stressed the importance of recognizing the critical role of climate change in the emergence and spread of infectious diseases. And the authors say that given the possibility raised by our analysis that global greenhouse gas emissions may have a, been a contributing factor in SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks, we echo calls for decisive climate change mitigation, including as a part of COVID-19 economic recovery programs. This is as a mean to minimize future zoonotic spillover and the tremendous social and economic damage associated with them. Um, and you can see the average temperature, uh, this is data from now, NASA has increased about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is worldwide. Um, this is 0.8 degrees Celsius over the past 100 years. This is according to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. The IPPC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reports that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees um, Celsius between 20. Uh, they actually move that up between 2025 and 2030 um, if it continues to increase at the current rate. Allowing temperatures to rise beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius will have devastating consequences. This will be loss of natural habitats, species, even high, higher sea level rises, dwindling ice caps, spreading of deserts, and catastrophic storms. The authors of this paper also add that spillovers of coronaviruses and other zoonosis to humans have been shown to be closely linked to an increase in contact with pathogen carrying wildlife, driven by the expansion and intensification of agriculture, hunting, and infrastructure development. To reduce the risk of future zoonotic spillovers, it is crucial to introduce measures to protect natural habitats, impose strong regulations on wildlife hunting and trade, establish appropriate animal welfare standards on farms, markets, and transport vehicles, and encourage high zoonotic risk dietary and medic medicinal customs, whilst also accommodating the socioeconomic needs that drive current patterns. Sound understanding of the ecological dynamics underlying zoonotic disease emergence is essential for effective health and environmental planning and for eliminating dangerous and counterproductive practices such as bat persecution. And I love that they added that because um, there are some policies in different areas um, targeting bats and wanting to do a mass extermination of bats because we've all heard that bats cause these coronaviruses. But we discussed previously how important bats are for the ecosystem. They provide pest control, pollination, seed dispersal, 
And they're also great for studying aging, cancer prevention, and um, disease defense. And I'll look briefly um, at this one sector of agri that causes 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This graph over here shows all of the different factors leading to global greenhouse gas emissions, but we're gonna look at this one major sector right here. And this is um, broken down by the type of food um, that contributes to these um, greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. Um, meat production is one of the most important ways in which humanity affects the environment. We cut down and burn forests to create pasture as well as arable land to meet the demand for animal feed. It produces more emissions per unit of energy compared with that of plant-based foods because energy is lost at each trophic level. Within types of meat, ruminant production, and ruminants are those four stomach am animals that chew their cud, um, the cows, goats, sheep, um, they produce the most emissions because um, they also uh, eructate, which is belch methane. Um, and they also eat a great deal and drink a lot of water. Chicken production leads to less emissions than that of mammals. Um, but meat, meat production is the single most important source of methane, which has a relatively high warming potential, but a low half-life in the environment compared with that of CO2. Um, here's another graph um, showing the various pounds of CO2 per serving of various food items. But despite increasing awareness about animal suffering, pandemics, and environmental decision, freshwater contamination, worker exploitation, antibiotic resistance per capita, uh, or antibiotic resistance, sorry, per capita, meat consumption continues to rise. A well-established empirical relationship known as Bennett's Law shows that as people become wealthier, their diets change from being largely based on starchy staples to diets that incorporate increasing amounts of refined grains, fruit, vegetables, meat, and dairy. And they use Bennett's Law to project into the future um, how much we will eat, and they have suggested that a rise in wealth will lead to an increase in meat consumption of about 100% between um, 2005 and the mid-century. So the animal agriculture sector has considerable political influence and has allocated large amounts of money to advertising and marketing. Lobbying from the meat industry was intensive during the formulation of the US dietary guidelines. And civil society organizations claimed that this influenced the ev eventual erections. This graph ends at 2013, but the animal agriculture industry is reporting or maybe bragging that in 2019, we ate a record setting 223.7 pounds of meat per person. Now we don't have a problem with protein deficiency in this country, but we do have a serious problem with fiber deficiency. Adequate intake of dietary fiber is associated with um, digestive health and reduced risk for heart disease, stroke, hypertension, certain gastrointestinal disorders, obesity, type two diabetes, and certain cancers. According to consumer research, the public is aware of the benefits of fiber and most people believe they consume enough fiber. However, national consumption surveys show that only about 5% of the population meets recommendations and inadequate intakes have been called a public health concern. So what policies have been made to alter our diets so far away from what is healthy for us and the planet? marketing strategies and distribution of food has influenced our choices. What policies should the Biden administration put in place to reduce these trends? Um, well, there's a lot of questions to consider here. Um, what will the future look like? Will we continue to raise more animals for food to meet growing demand at the detriment of our environment? 
the IPPC is projecting that we will cross the threshold of 1.5 degree rise in global temperatures around 2025 to 2030. Our current emissions, unless curbed, will breach a crucial tipping point uh, sooner than expected, causing irreversible impacts. Now is the moment for governments, business, and the world as a whole to step up their climate ambition to avoid crossing a dangerous line of 1.5 degrees and even two degrees. It looks like that's coming too. We will have the tools, we have the tools, we have the targets, and now we know the only difference between the impossible and possible is political leadership. At two degrees, we will see a more than 99% loss of our coral reefs versus 70 to 90% at 1.5 degrees. Um, we'll see more droughts, more heat waves, more floods. Many insects, plants, and vertebrates will lose their climactically determined ranges. We'll see lower economic growth and lower yields and nutritional content of crops. Um, that's my next slide. Um, but that's, I'll discuss more of that later in my next presentation. I'm going to throw it back to Andrew.